All right, welcome back everybody to the Bulletproof Handyman Business Channel. So today we're going to go over red flags for new clients. Uh, by the way, let me know my audio is good if you're in here. I ask right at the beginning every time because I've had so many problems. So if you could just let me know if I sound all right. Um, so we're going over red flags. And I want to be super clear about something. Somebody having one or two or three of these red flags, uh, I am by no means trying to say that if you see any of these, run away right away. This is more of a list of lots of things that when they start adding up and stacking up on top of each other, it's giving you an indication as they build that this may not be the right client for you. And in my opinion, what I would do if I started seeing too many of these pop up is I would just drop it. I would just, if I don't have an agreement already, if I have not scheduled them and agreed and said, yes, I'm going to do this job for you, then I would just drop these guys right away. Because what ends up happening inevitably is you're going to see some of these flags and it's only going to be a few and then you're going to see a few more. And then before you know it, you're halfway into the job and this client is just wasting all of your time. You're not going to make the money you need. They're just, they become a big hassle and you could have used that time to be finding better clients or working on better paying jobs. So we're just going to start at the list at the top of the list that I wrote down here. And there's more than these. And by the way, if you all have red flags you look for, please share them in the comments. I'm going to go through this whole list and I'm going to explain all of these. And then at the end, I'm going to start going through all of your comments and seeing what other red flags y'all might have been able to give me that I can add to this list so I can do higher quality content in the future. So number one, they insist that you provide free in-person estimates, specifically, especially for small jobs. You really don't like this. And so what this typically looks like is you get a call. Let's say you're working for homeowners. I don't, at least very, very rarely. But a lot of y'all are, if not most of y'all. So you get a call from a homeowner and they say, yeah, I want to get a, a new kitchen faucet installed. And you say, okay, that'll be 125 bucks or 150 bucks, whatever your price is. You can just tell them right off the bat, like, yeah, here's the price for it. You can pick the faucet up if you want. You can put it on will call and I'll pick it up. Or you can send me a picture of the one you want and I'll pick it up on my way there. And then they want you to come to the house to take a look at it. You know, they say, oh, well, can you can you just come by and make sure that like everything is right under the sink and that we don't need to do anything else? But long story short is they just they they always want you to personally come to their house and look at whatever it is. And now, of course, if they want you to like remodel a bathroom, you need to go to the house. But I'm talking about for these small jobs. These people are looking more for attention than they are having a problem and needing to pay somebody to get it fixed. So that's the first one. Um, Tori said, good afternoon. Thank you for your live. Great advice and content. Thank you, Tori. I appreciate that. I appreciate you too. I see you all over my channel and I do. A I enjoy the engagement. I enjoy knowing that there's people out there that I'm back and forth with that are getting something out of this. Next red flag is that they insist on item. You know what? Let's go back to this other one because I also did specify free estimates. Now you can charge for an estimate. And that's kind of another red flag is let's say they do ask you to come by and look at it. The correct response, the professional response would be something to the effect of, yeah, I can come by. But just so you know, we do charge whatever it is. Maybe you're going to have a lower price, like $80 for estimates or something. Um, but it's specifically that they want you to come by and do free estimates. So if they're OK with you charging money to come by, that's fine. They still may want just entertainment and company. But as long as they're going to pay you for that time, you know, then you're good to go. Next one, they insist on itemization. Um, so like, for example, when I do an estimate, typically I wouldn't call this itemization, but I itemize labor and materials. I don't itemize each one. You get one line item that says labor. You get one line item that says materials. And this is mostly for my property managers. Um, it wouldn't be for anybody else. And even then, Oftentimes, I don't even split labor and materials. I just give a one price. It's a take it or leave it price. However, you know, my property managers send me a lot of work, tens of thousands of dollars a year each in work. So if they just want to know how much of that's labor and how much of that 
is materials. I don't mind letting them know because they're not tracking my time. They're not figuring out any hourly rate on me or anything. Uh, one more time, by the way, guys, just because nobody said anything yet. Uh, again, if you could, please, I think if my audio was bad, y'all probably would have let me know by now. But just let me know that my audio is good, assuming it is good. And so, yeah, insisting on itemization. Um, again, this is not something where as soon as somebody asks for itemization, you need to run away. But in the grand scheme of things, with all of the qualities that go into making a good client or a bad client, Clients that want itemization, well, itemization costs you time. So to the extent that you can veer away from clients who want everything itemized, like every single little piece of material, or they want to see your receipts for what you paid for the materials, those types of things, uh, they want you to break down your labor into actual numbers of hours or even worse into how many hours, like 3.5 hours for demo and this for that. These people are too worried about price and they're not bad people for being worried about price. It's totally legitimate to just, you know, I, I could be somebody who's worried about price depending on what the price is. But my point is, is that when they're asking for that, oftentimes what they're really trying to do is they're scared that you're trying to screw them out of their money. So they're going to want to nitpick every little charge that you have because there's some people that especially neurotic people, they just have a mindset that the world is out to get them. So they're out to protect themselves from you. And granted, again, that doesn't mean you need to run away just because of that. They might ask you to itemize the first time and you do. And then the next, or maybe you don't, but either way, they may ask you the first time, but then when you do the job and you do a good job and they're very happy with the price, the work, the quality, everything, then in the future, they might just stop asking you but it's one more thing to add to that list that you're looking for. Hey, what's going on, Noel Hopkins? How you doing, sir? Uh, let's see. Next one is that they insist that they buy the materials. I'm doing one of these right now. However, the guy that I'm doing this for, he bought all the materials, him and his wife. A lot of them are the wrong materials, and I'm going to have to buy more. But he is a very close personal friend of the owner of my favorite client, my favorite property management company, which comes with multiple property managers and probably probably seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars a year worth of work that they send me. It's the owner's very close friend. So all I did was I put in my quote a stipulation on pretty much every line item on the quote that says, if I do this job, I'm going to need more materials and for me to give you this pricing, because I'm trying to give them very good pricing. This is a personal favor to the owner of the property management company. If I give you this pricing, it's based on me being efficient. And the way for me to be efficient is when I need materials to complete your job, I can't be shutting down work and waiting for approval. So whatever materials I need that are necessary, I'm going to go purchase them and I'm going to invoice them at cost. Now, don't worry. I'm making plenty of money on the labor. I'm not uh, I'm not underselling myself. But whereas I normally see a window that I know I'm going to get this done in like two and a half to three days, let's say, I see that window. And most of the time, I'm going to estimate it. If I think it's two and a half to three days, I'm going to estimate my labor under the assumption it's going to take longer rather than be faster. On this one, I'm estimating towards the lower end of that. And I'm planning very well to make sure I get everything knocked out in order on time quickly. Let's see. Uh, oh, no, you're out knocking out property management work orders. Congratulations, sir. That is a good position to be in. Michael Wetterburn said, greetings from the Sunshine Island of Jamaica. I hope you all are well. Man, I would love to go to Jamaica. That'd be really nice. Um, Noel said he's buying all the materials. Yep, that's pretty standard with property management. I buy all the materials. Um, Noel said, had the property manager's son, Brian, air conditioner today, and it was way too small. I don't quite understand that the job was too small or the AC was too small. But anyways, moving on here. Um, they're going to insist that they buy the materials. That's what these guys have done. But I made sure my estimate, which they have to sign and approve, clearly states that I will purchase additional materials and add it to the bill so that they can't come back 
and say that, you know, that my estimate went over what I said it was going to be. But generally speaking, when clients want to be the ones to buy the materials, it's because they're worried you're going to screw them on materials. Their best friend or their mom told them, yeah, you got to watch out for those contractors because they'll go buy, you know, a window for $120 and then they'll charge you $240. And maybe, maybe that's what you do. Maybe that's not what you do. I don't hide any of my costs in the materials. I don't mark up my materials, but my labor more than covers it. You know, you can put the cost anywhere. You can have upcharge fees. You can mark things up. You can have a fee for this and a fee for that. In the end, it's, it's a a price, a final price for a final product. I just prefer to go ahead and be honest about the materials. And then the labor that I went through to acquire them is on the labor portion of the job. And it's not broken down. It's just when I figure out the labor, I'm figuring on my trip to Home Depot or to whatever supply store or the time that I'm spending at the computer ordering things online. But be careful when they insist that they buy the materials, especially if they want to go to the hardware store or Home Depot or whatever supply house, if they want to go with you and personally run their card, they're not going to be happy that you're going to charge them for that time. So yeah, it's another red flag. If they want to pay for the materials, you're a professional, you're a business. You've never had a guy, for example, like Noel here today, you've never had a guy come to work on your air conditioner at your house and gone out and told the air conditioner guy from the local company that you want to go with him when he purchases your new fan motor and you want to see the price and run your card yourself. That's just not a thing. Christopher said, uh, do you charge property managers for estimates going out to assess any property before any work is approved? It all for me, it used to be that I never did free estimates. Now the position I'm in is I've gotten everybody. I, I got everybody trained in the past. I got all my property managers trained to understand that anytime they send me an estimate, I'm immediately going to reply back and say, are you okay with me invoicing for this? Because I don't do free estimates. And then I would say the other alternative is you send me one piece of work at this property that is approved that I can do and charge for. And then if you do that, then while I'm there, I'll go ahead and take my measurements and stuff and get you a free estimate if my trip to the property is at least covered by some sort of approved work. Now, today, I don't have to do that anymore, but it took me a year to train them to get them to the point where they understood that I'm not going to go all over town doing free estimates just for curious investment property owners. So now some of them are free, some of them are not. If it's a very large job and I have good reason to believe if it's from a property manager who doesn't waste my time with free estimates all the time, and I know he's going to be pushing to get it approved at my price, I do it for free because it's going to get approved eight times out of 10, let's say. And I have other property managers that almost none of their estimates ever get approved. And I just don't do free estimates for them anymore. So, But that took a lot of work, guys. Like that took a year of the most, the same property manager every other week asking me for an estimate and then pretending to be surprised when I say I'm going to have to charge money for the estimate. It took a lot of work to get to that. <sighs> But and so, for example, also here in Tucson, there's a very big property management company that I don't do any work for ever. And I could. They need guys bad. They call me every now and then because my info is on file with them. But I had to talk to their like director of maintenance and he wants an estimate for every job. And I said, well, what about, you know, half of my jobs, like most of my jobs, if it's a one off. It's going to be $125. And if by chance I show up and it's going to go over, I can just call you or text you or whatever and just get approval to go over. And he was very clear. He's like, no, no, no. Estimate written for every single job. And I just had to say, well, I just, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't work that way. But some of them will want that. And again, that's just them trying to spend as little money as possible. There's nothing wrong with people wanting to save money. There's really nothing like when I go shopping, I try to find good deals, uh, but that's not the clients that I want. And those are the clients that are going to waste a lot of your time because there are too many clients out there that have money and are ready to spend it and appreciate the value that you're going to bring and understand that you're worth it and understand why you're worth it. So let's see. Yep. If they insist on 
that they buy the materials. Oh, where did the other one go? Anyways, the free estimates. Let me check the comments here. Oh, that's where I got that from was the question about free estimates. All right, I'm going to move down this list a little more so I don't take too long getting through the list, but I will go back and forth to the comments. So the next one is that they don't want to pay you for your time. And this kind of goes back to what I was just saying. Like, let's say a homeowner wants to go to Home Depot with you to pick up materials or they want you to come over and do a free estimate and they don't want to pay you for that time. Any, There's so much time. Like, let's say you need to match tile. Somebody has a tile job and it's, you know, 18 year old tile. And now you need to find either a match or the closest match possible. That's going to do that. If you even find a match, you could spend an entire day. And what's a day's labor worth if you're on the job six hours a day invoicing for six hours a day at $100 an hour, which is the minimum that y'all should be charging. There are exceptions like if you're in a really small rural area, you may not be able to do that. But generally speaking, I'm talking about the minimum $600 days by working six hours at $100 an hour. If you spend a day trying to find tile for them, or if you spend three hours at home in the evening online trying to find that tile, you need to get paid for that time and they don't want to pay you for that time. So that's a big one right there where for me, I actually would walk away immediately if they were upset that they needed to pay me my going rate to do stuff that's required for their job, then you just need to go because they're going to be a really bad customer, just a really, really bad customer. Another one, this is a smaller one here, guys. This is not one you walk away right away for, but if they want to help, if they say, hey, if you can cut the price down a little bit, I can help. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know, if you, if you are a good person who likes doing favors for people every now and then, and you feel that they're sincere and that they really need this job done and you like them, they have a healthy, happy family and well-behaved kids, and you just want to be a good guy, go ahead and be a good guy. There's nothing wrong with that. But as far as looking for red flags, a lot of times they're going to say that they can help you out. Or again, they can go buy the materials for you or something like that but they're going to want to help out in exchange for a discount. And just generally speaking, just wanting a discount, trying to find ways to get you to knock the price down. There's nothing wrong with it, but there are clients out there who have money, are ready to spend it, value your time and your service, and are ready to hire you right away and have you go do that job. So when you have those types of clients already available, you don't want to waste a lot of time on the ones who are trying to find a way to nickel and dime you down all the time. Next, I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to go to the comments for just a little bit so we don't get too backed up there. Next is that they won't pay a deposit. And guys, for me, this is a walk away. This is a one and done walk away. If it's a big job, especially if it's materials heavy, but even if it's no materials, even if it's like drywall, which is 30 bucks worth of materials, if they don't want to pay a deposit, then just walk away. The ones who don't want to pay a deposit are often, not always, but often the same ones that when you finish the job, they don't want to pay you. They're going to find something wrong with your job, something they're not happy with, and they're not going to want to pay you. They're going to say, hey, I noticed a little teeny tiny itty bitty little mistake right here that you can barely notice. And I need you to come back and fix it before I pay you, which is one reason my invoices and estimates say that we will come back within the next 30 days, within 30 days of doing the job for any minor touch-ups and stuff that are requested. But the deal with that is that doesn't mean you don't have to pay the invoice. It means you have to pay the invoice. However, once you've paid the invoice, we will come back and do touch-ups for free if they're legit. But when somebody doesn't want to pay you a deposit, that's the same type of person that at the end is going to try to find a reason not to pay you or to pay you significantly less. All right, let's look at these comments real quick. Noel said I had to measure it. They didn't measure it. He just bought the cheapest one he could find, and I'm getting paid to install it. I see. It was the AC itself that you were installing. Uh, Home Rapid Repair said, howdy, howdy, everyone. The Geeker said, I work as a commercial door installer. I just have not taken the plunge to do it on my own yet. I really appreciate all the time you put into this channel. Well, the Geeker, I'll tell you this. Whatever job you're doing in the trades... There is more money to be made doing it for yourself. 
the only, there's two ways to start. You can start with side work, but if you really know what you're doing and if you have confidence and if you're willing to put everything into it, and I do mean everything, 24-7, your life revolves around your new business. If you're willing to do that, you can and will succeed and you will make more money than you ever were going to get paid by any employer because they're only employing you because they're making a profit off of you. They didn't employ you just to get rid of some work. They employed you to make money. So you can charge the same that they're charging. And instead of getting your paycheck and then them getting part of what you earned, you just go ahead and get all of it. It's not easy by any means. In fact, I don't know if y'all can tell I'm a little slow today. I'm beat because I just I keep not getting any days off or what I call a day off like today is all about invoicing estimates, all kinds of stuff. The YouTube thing, which I luckily enjoy, but it's like nonstop all day, all the time. So it's very hard. Don't go into this thing and it's not hard, but you can make more money for yourself than what you'll ever make with somebody else paying you. Michael Wetterburn said, I do my handyman business on a part-time basis servicing homeowners here on the island, but I must say that your videos are golden. Thank you for all the time and effort you put into making these videos. You're very welcome, sir. And even though you're doing homeowners and even though you're in another country, nonetheless, most of these lessons still apply because proper, you know, I promote working for property managers for a handful of very specific reasons. I did a whole video on homeowners versus property managers. However, property managers are also people. The, the flaws that a homeowner is going to have are the same flaws that your property managers can have. The only difference is once you've got a handful of property managers, between two to five, depending on how large they are, once you have them, you have them and you don't need to vet new people and you don't have the headaches of constantly figuring this out with every new client. So most of the advice still does apply. Noel said, you have to know the people you're working with. Uh, a lot will throw a maintenance limit as a general description. I simply call them and tell them what it's going to cost. They usually approve it. That's true. So, Noel, um, this is good for all of y'all to know. This is extra working for property managers, handyman information. As a property management company, when you sign on somebody who owns an investment property that they want you to go get rented out for them, you sign a contract, the homeowner and the property management company sign a contract. Part of that contract, very standard across the board, very standard is going to be, there's going to be two maintenance limit. There's going to be a lower limit, let's say between 250 to maybe $450. I found 300 or 350 is pretty average. And the idea is that the property management company has an agreement that if it doesn't exceed this amount, call it 300, if it's not more than 300, we don't need your approval. We're not going to have to call you every time we need a $200 job done. We're just going to get it done and take it out of your account. And then they also have another limit for emergencies, which is usually closer to like 600, maybe all the way up to 1,000, but let's say 600 to 850, somewhere in there. If it's an emergency, then they don't have to call for approval if it's an emergency up to that amount. So what you get is, as Noel was saying, they'll send a maintenance limit along with the work order. Now, my two main clients, one of them, they don't put it in the work order. I just know I've been working for them a long time. These are my favorite guys, the ones I talk about all the time. Um, I just understand. I know what theirs are and I know what they will and won't approve. I know when something is maybe urgent, like say 350 is the limit, but if I can't reach them, I'm going to do it up to 450 or 500 or whatever, but they trust me and we have a good, strong relationship. And I know, for example, if I'm at a house and the job's already going to be 350, and then I see that there's an actual active leak under the sink dripping onto the cabinet. I'm going to fix that for them, even if I can't reach them to get approval. And they're going to pay me because they understand that I understand what their goals are and that I'm always helping them move towards their goals. But what Noel's talking about is they'll attach arbitrary limits. So you'll have like a new girl and she's trying to impress the homeowners or impress somebody by keeping your prices down because you have a reputation of being a more expensive handyman. So she'll send you a work order and say, do this, this, and this, and do not exceed $250. But you know that that company's policy is $350. The contracts they're signing with the homeowners say $350. 
she's applying an arbitrary lower limit because she thinks she knows what you should be charging. And that situation, let's say she said, keep it under 250. And let's say my charge would have been 225. By the mere fact that she said, keep it under 250, I guarantee you, I'm going to text her and say, this is going to be 275. Just to, to let her know, you don't get to attach arbitrary limits to these. You're not a handyman. You're a property manager. Your job is to assign work to me. My job is to do the work and invoice correctly. And if you think I charge too much, you just don't have to send the work to me, but you're not going to attach. And again, I don't say any of this. I just say, this is going to be 275. I'm going to need approval for that. And then eventually they start figuring out, they notice the pattern. Every time I attach an arbitrary lower limit than the 350, this guy makes it more. And then they stop doing that. In my experience, they do stop doing that. Next. <clears throat> Noel said a lot of times being a good guy every now and then goes a long way. I agree. I mean, because we're all people, you know. We're a business and we need to make all our business decisions based on being a business. But as another example, I'm from West Texas and West Texas, if a car's broke down on the side of the road, guarantee you a second car is right behind them, helping them out. People stop and help people. So I'm running a business. I have a place to be. I have an appointment. If I see somebody broke down on the side of the road and I think I can help and it's not like I'm not in emergency mode, I'll call my tenant and say, hey, I'm going to help somebody real quick that's broke down on the side of the road and I'll help them just because I like being a good person. So, you know, don't just go doing favors for everybody that gives you a sob story. But when you feel sincerely as a human being that there's another human being that is asking you for help and you're able to help them without taking too much of a loss, help them, you know, be a good person. Let's see. Rob said, my first big private job, I spent so much time walking around Home Depot with them for free and ended up taking me twice as long to finish the job. Yeah, because they'll want a faucet, you know, and if 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 they don't go to Home Depot with you, if you have the kind of rapport I have with my property managers and the kind of leeway I have in making decisions, you know, I put the same faucet in almost every house. If the existing faucet is a little too different from my standard faucet, then I just pick one that's going to match. And I do the same with homeowners. I usually say, if you'll send me a picture of your existing faucet, I will find a complimentary faucet that I know to be of high quality and at a good price. And oftentimes they'll say yes. But there's just, I learned that the hard way when I first got started. These, these people would just, they want a faucet. They don't know which one they want. You show up and you think that they're going to have it already. And they don't, they haven't purchased it yet because they're not sure and they want to know if you can just go to Home Depot with them and help them pick it out. Two hours later, after they've really thoroughly analyzed every faucet on the shelf, you finally get one, go back to their house, and I dare you to try to invoice them for it. You, you're going to have an unhappy client leaving bad reviews for you and stuff. It's another reason I got out of homeowners and into property management was because they just, the homeowners can be fickle and you you make them mad, you don't give them what they want, or they're just one of those people that just needs to be right. And if you don't let them be right and do what they want, then they're going and leaving bad reviews for you and stuff. Not that it matters. You know, you can have bad reviews, but if you care about reviews, they're going to be leaving some bad reviews if you want to invoice them for two hours. So $200 for walking around Home Depot with them. Next, Null said anything over $1,000 gets a 50% deposit or it's a no-go. Yeah, that's about where I'm at. It could be, it depends on the job and it depends on how much of it is materials and how much is labor. But yeah, for me, I'd say anything, when it starts approaching like seven or $800, then I'm definitely putting a deposit on it. Um, if it's from a tenant who destroyed their rental before they left, and I know there's a good chance there isn't going to be enough money in the deposit to pay me, I'll say and their deposit to pay me, then I will tell the property management company, I need a deposit before starting work. And I also, on my quote, I send them a quote that they have to sign that has a line that says that they need to verify for me that the money to pay me is available from the homeowner if it exceeds what's left in the tenant's deposit. 
John says, do you always require a deposit even with property managers? Okay, so I kind of went over that. No, I don't always. I require it with property managers that I don't trust. And I don't mean that I think are horrible. I wouldn't work for them if I really didn't trust them. But I do it for property managers that I don't think are good at their job and who may be willing to short me my money for a little while because they're too weak to stand up to a homeowner and say, hey, I sent my handyman here because you asked me to. He did the work. I need you to pay him. Most property managers are too weak to do that. So if it's one of those, if it's heavy on materials, there's a lot of different reasons. But you just learn over time when when you can expect to get paid for sure and when you need to maybe take a few extra steps to make sure you're going to get paid. So I'm going to go back to this list real quick, guys, because I don't want to get too far gone and I'll come back to the comments as well. Another red flag is going to be that when they first talk to you, like right away, especially when you're talking about pricing, they let you know that they have lots of other work you can do in the future if they're happy with this one. And they have lots of friends who need lots of work too. High, high paying friends with nice houses that all need a lot of work. And this is your first encounter with them. They don't even know if your work is good yet. And they're already, what they're doing is they're trying to convince you to drop your price for them. Because if you do, they will send you more work in the future from their friends or from themselves. You don't know them yet. Don't drop your price and look at that as a red flag. Don't run away right away, you know, because I do the same thing when I hire other handymen. I have a lot of work. So a lot of times if I go hire one guy for one job, like I need a specialist for something that I don't feel I'm qualified for. If I go hire that guy, I'll always at some point I'll be like, hey, by the way, do you want more work? Because I actually do. You know, if I like the guy and it seems to be working out, I'll say, hey, do you want more work? Because, I mean, I have some work I can send you in the future if you're open to that. And for me, I'm just being respectful and making sure to not assume that just because he was available for me this time that he's always going to be available. So it's not 100% a red flag, but it is something to look at. I'd, I'd say more than half the time, they're looking for a discount when they're offering future work. And that future work often never comes. Next red flag. Uh, they describe the job as easy or fast. They say, yeah, yeah, no, all I, it's just like a small hole in the drywall, just like a quick patch, just a real quick, like not hard at all. When they start describing the job in terms of how easy and quick it's going to be, it's because they, I don't know why they think this, but it's as if they think that they can put, they can trick you into thinking it's easier than it is. You're the handyman. You've done a thousand patches. You know exactly what it takes to do a fist sized patch. You know exactly what it takes to do a 24 inch by 24 inch patch. You know what it takes to rip the tape down out of a seam that's falling out and put new tape up and patch over that. You know all of this. And they're trying to describe the job to you as if you've never seen it before. As a very easy, fast, quick, almost just bare. You don't even have to pick up any like you can just come in and snap your fingers and it'll be done. That's a red flag. They're looking to get you to charge as little as possible. And again, nothing wrong with it. They're not bad people. They want to deal. But I don't want clients who want to deal. I want clients who recognize my value and are willing to pay me my fair value for my work. Next, uh, they require hourly rates. Now, I'm going to tell you all this. I've said it on some other videos because I want to be super clear. I don't want anybody getting confused and feeling uh, like they weren't given all the information. If and when you decide that you're never, ever going to give anybody an hourly rate, no property managers, no homeowners, nobody. When you say, I don't give hourly rates. My rates vary depending on the skills. Depend you can list a few reasons why your rates would vary, but I do not give hourly rates. And I do not give set pricing, like actual standardized. I use set pricing and I use a value that I that I attach to my time, which you could call an hourly rate. I use that, but I don't give it to anybody. I have had very big property management companies here, ones that were excited to have me. I was excited to get on with them. I needed the work. I've had really good situations where then it came down to they wanted either a pricing list with standardized pricing or they wanted an hourly rate. And when I said no, 
They chose to not utilize my services. And to this day, they won't utilize my services, which is fine because I have a lot of work now. Like my problem isn't work. I don't need more work. I always am trying to get rid of work. But if they require hourly rates, to me, that's a red flag. And the reason it is is because my experience very early on was clients who require hourly rates and will not hire you without it. They are trying to pay attention and figure out how many hours you're spending. I had one company that had a sign in and sign out book at their vacant properties. If you showed up at the property, you actually had to sign in with the time that you arrived and sign out with the time you left because they were trying to compare the books to the rates. Guys, you're valuable. For example, you troubleshoot an electrical outlet that doesn't work and maybe it only took you 10 minutes and then it took you five minutes to fix it and you're out of there. If they had to hire an electrician, a certified electrician, that's $200 just for him to show up at the door. So yes, maybe I was only there 15 minutes, but I just saved you money because I'm not charging you 200, but I'm going to charge you 165 for that 15 minute job because that's the value. That's my value. If I wasn't charging you 165 for that 15 minutes, I could have had another job with another property manager developing another relationship with somebody who's going to pay me good money for my services. And it's not their money they're spending. If it's under that 350, if it's not out of the ballpark of what any other professional would charge to do that job, there's no reason that just because you're a handyman, you shouldn't be getting paid what the value of your service is. So let's move on to some comments again before we get too far behind. Sean said, nope, here we go. Let's see. Noel said, crazy to see you on the internet in the middle of the day. Yeah, man, I took the day off for admin work. I wasn't going to. I really was dead set on working. And honestly, it's probably a bad decision. But I'm so exhausted. I need to clean my van out. I need to clean up a bunch of junk that I've just been dumping in the front yard because I haven't had time to make a dump run recently. I needed to get estimates written. I need to get stuff invoiced. There's so much to do. And I feel like I'm uh, letting y'all down on YouTube. Like I'm not posting, uh, let's say, the quantity of content that I should be posting. So I'm trying to get caught up and get this information out some more. But mostly I was just so damn tired that I thought, you know what, I'm going to do better here at home sitting at a desk as much as I hate sitting at a desk. I'm going to be more productive here today than I would be on the job. And the job I'm on is going to take days to finish. So it's really irrelevant whether it happens to be, you know, Saturday or Sunday when I Noel said, uh, got to take an admin day, bro. I do. That's just what I got to do. Tori said at 3.30 a.m., a 3.30 a.m. text for a non-emergency job was a red flag for me. Yeah. Unless those are the types of people that you can charge them $500 for a 45-minute job, then I agree. That is To me, that's rude. Whatever is going on, if it's not an emergency, they don't respect you. And by the way, that's what most of this list comes down to. These are all very small signs of disrespect. None of them individually are 100% disrespect, but they're all small signs of you not receiving respect because they view you as just a handyman rather than as a business owner. So a text at 3.30 a.m. for a non-emergency, that's disrespectful. The type of person who doesn't respect you is the type of person who's not going to want to pay you what you're worth. Uh, Tori said, ended up being a good client, just very exacting in the work that was done. I was nervous the whole time. Noel said, my commercial property managers pay everything the same day the invoice is sent out. No questions asked. Love them. Dude, that's nice. Is this a, a national chain where I could get their number and start working for them in Tucson, maybe? Or are you just really lucky and you found a local place? That's great, man. I would look, dude, I would die to get paid same day. I have the no questions asked down. They don't, they've all figured out now. I charge what I charge. My rates actually are fair and I'm not going to negotiate them unless it's a favorite property manager. And they don't even ask me to negotiate, but sometimes they call me and say, hey, can I get some extra info on this? The homeowner is just being crazy and they're asking all these questions and I just need to be able to just like they're selling me. They're they're telling the homeowner they need to hire me and they need to pay me. They're selling me. 
but they're saying they need a lot of questions answered because, and they're, they're talking shit about the homeowner. Oftentimes I'll knock a couple hundred bucks off of a thousand dollar invoice as a favor. And I'll say, Hey, here, tell them I knocked two and tell them you got me to knock $200 off so that they can see that you're advocating for them. And they appreciate that guys. They really do. Next, uh, let's see where are we at. Rando said yesterday I registered as an LLC, got my EIN. Today I'm getting insurance and opening a business bank account. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I finally pulled the proverbial trigger. That is awesome, Rando. Don't forget my email address, bulletproofhandymanbusiness at gmail.com. I will answer everybody, but specifically people in your position. If you're pulling the trigger and you're jumping in, you're going to have a lot of questions, a lot of challenges, a lot of just maybe maybe you know what the right answer is, but you just want to verify. Do not hesitate to email me and just ask me or you can comment like on this post or something. But get in touch with me in whatever way works for you. If you're in the process of getting started and you've pulled the trigger, bulletproof handyman business at gmail.com. I will help you all out to the best I can. I'm not the world renowned expert on this. I'm just the guy who decided to go ahead and make a channel and tell you what I figured out so far and tell you when I figure out that I used to be wrong and now I have something better. But don't hesitate to email me if you need anything. Rando. Noel said, I had a guy who had a uh, $2.3 million home and wanted to only pay me $20 an hour because he only looked at me as unskilled labor. And he can just go himself, right? right he can go find somebody else there's plenty of 20 dollar an hour guys out there and you can come back and fix his mistakes later for a hundred an hour noel says he always asked me for an on-the-spot estimate by telling me how long he thinks it would take never give hourly rate i agree man this is this guy noel's talking about is the perfect example of all the stuff i'm talking about here He's decided what Noel's hourly rate is. He's decided how long the job should take. He knows everything, but for some reason, he needs to hire Noel, doesn't he? So just don't work for those people. I mean, especially if somebody says 20 bucks an hour, you probably should just walk away right away. I mean, if they say like, if, if you say I charge 100 bucks an hour and they say, ooh, that's a little steep. Can we do 90? I don't know. Like weigh, weigh the client. You, you can maybe impress them and then get more work and more referrals. This is all a guessing game a lot of times. It's a educated guess, you know, from your gut, from your experience. But I mean, if somebody's at 20 and you're at 100 or 125 or 150, there's no room to come together in the middle there. They just don't understand what it is you're providing to them. Noel said this fella always promised me more work, but he was crazy cheap. Yep, that was... Uh... That was, uh, which one was it? Yeah, they have lots of friends and lots of work. They always do that. They promise more work. Rob said, I always have people ask for my info because they need something small done. I feel bad for not giving out my info, but I'd rather be slow for a bit between property managers than do private work, honestly. I exactly, if you're, especially in my opinion, if you're going to work for property managers, it's better to only work for them. Because the homeowners, the individuals who are not property managers, who pull you away from the property management work, what they're doing is they're dropping the quality that you're delivering to the clients who send you tens of thousands of dollars worth of work every year. Because the clients who send you tens of thousands of dollars worth of work, one of the requirements they have is that you get shit done in a timely manner. So if you're constantly putting off this job. You could have been doing this job, but instead you were over here doing a homeowner's job. You're maybe not by a lot, but you're dropping down your quality. You're lowering the speed at which you're getting these jobs done. So if you've chosen to do property managers, always prioritize them and be an expert at knowing what they need and giving them what they need. Let's see. Rob said, I almost act like I'm an employee while I'm working so people don't start bugging me to look at this or that. Yeah, that's a thing, man. Just, you know, it's like I tell the guys who do work for me, including my son, when tenants are trying to have them do extra stuff or trying to have them do something different, trying to convince them to put a different ceiling fan up than the one that I chose. I just tell them all the time. I say, you just tell them your boss said such and such. And then I remind them, I'm like, I'm not your boss. You're independent. You are absolutely independent, but I am fine 
with you using me being your boss as an excuse to just simply get your job done and get out of there. So if somebody says, hey, can you look at this real quick? Your answer can be, sorry, my boss was very clear that I'm only to do what's on this checklist. And he said for me to tell anybody who asks for more work that they need to contact the property manager and request that work officially. Mark, Mark Albert, how are you doing, sir? I see you all the time, man. I hope you're killing it. Mark said, great advice to focus on third-party property managers. Caught attention of one recently, apparently impressed him with previous work. Fixed a furnace for him yesterday, promptly got another $1,200 job. That's what I'm talking about. Good job, Mark. I am happy to hear that. Noel said, uh, nope, a local place. Only 13 buildings, but we're talking million-dollar buildings. That's awesome. I'm jealous, man. It's very rare that I'm jealous. That is a better client than I have ever had. I would see. So this is another thing. So Noel, you don't have to respond to this. And I'm not telling you what you should or shouldn't do. And I'm not making claims as to what you do or don't do. But if I was in Noel's position and these people were paying me same day and never bitching about my prices, if every now and then they ask me, if they say, hey, we've just got like a weird homeowner and they just they really want an itemized estimate, and I know you don't usually do that, I would do that for them. Or like the situation I'm in, where the owner of the company, of my favorite company that I do work for, says to me, and he didn't ask for favors, he just let me know that these people were very close personal friends of his. Because he said those words, I am focusing on those clients, and I'm doing the best I can do for them at a cheaper price than usual, and I'm being very flexible with them because it's going to help out the person who's responsible for half of the income of my business. He didn't ask me to, and you know what? If he did, maybe I'd even say no. It depends, but I do it as a favor to say, hey, you keep my family fed. I'm going to help keep your family fed. All right, let's get back to this list. We are not done with red flags, guys. And don't forget, if y'all have other red flags you want to add, yes, I'm not done with the list yet, but you can add red flags of your own, and I'm going to add them to this list because I'm eventually going to put this in some sort of document that y'all can request like you do all the other documents. Next, uh, they won't sign a contract. I don't think I need to say a lot about that. Anybody who's not willing to sign a contract, I don't care if it's for $50 or $50,000, if they won't sign a contract, walk away. I'm not saying you have to have them. I mean, I don't make most of my people sign contracts because they're property managers. Even a homeowner, if it's a faucet change, I'm not going to ask them to sign a contract. But whatever the scenario is, if you feel like you want a contract signed and you've taken the time to write it up and all they got to do is sign it and it's very clear and written well, if they won't sign a contract, go somewhere else and find better clients. You're going to waste your time with these guys. Next red flag, uh, they don't know exactly what they want. This is very nuanced because some people just have a lot of money and they're willing to pay you and they don't know what they want because they're expecting you to inform them on what the options are. So that's, that's a thing. However, most of the time, let's say somebody comes and says, hey, can you give me an estimate to fix my bathroom up? We need to refresh the bathroom. If you ask them whether at the house, like you can go there and look at it or you can ask them on the phone. But if you start asking them questions about what the product should be and they don't know, it's usually because they're not serious. What they are is they're curious. They looked at their bathroom. They thought it looked ugly and they said, let's call some handymen and see what it would cost to get this fixed. That's not the same as a client who wants a new bathroom, has the money for a new bathroom and intends on getting a new bathroom. Because the ones who are intending on spending money and have decided I'm going to hire somebody to redo my bathroom, those guys know what they want. Or at least they, they'll tell you, I want to go one of two directions or I have three different things I'm thinking about. But they can, they can precisely tell you what their vision for their bathroom is. If they can't tell you what that vision is, they don't know, do you want a tub and a standing shower? Or do you want just a standing shower? Or do you want just a giant garden tub? Do you want a vanity? Or do you want like a pedestal sink? All of these questions. Do you want tile on the floor and on the walls or just on the floor? 
or if you want it on the walls, was there a, a, like a border? You, all of these questions, they should have answers to. They should be able to just stop you from talking, and they should be able to draw and explain their new bathroom that they're asking for. And if they can't, it's because they're curious. Curious people don't hire every time. They don't hire you half the time. Curious people is like 10, 15% of the time they are actually going to end up spending money with you. Next, right in line with knowing what they want or not knowing is they don't have a budget. Now, again, there are people, you know, I, I make enough money to hire somebody to do stuff to my house if I want. And I could be a guy who doesn't have a budget where, where you ask me, what's your budget? And I might say, I don't know, man, it depends. I mean, like, I know it's going to cost me this much to get the bare minimum done. And I don't think I want to spend any more than eight grand. But in between there, it's really just going to depend on what it is that, that you can offer. Like, I would appear to be a red flag client. So always keep in mind, these are not exact, but generally speaking, people who are planning on getting the work done, they've typically, before they called you, they've asked around or done a little internet research and they've gotten a grasp on ballpark what the pricing for this industry would be. They should have an idea that I can spend up to 5,000 and they can be precise and say, hey, I'm not saying I want to spend 5,000, but for the right job for the right perks, I might spend up to five, but they know what the lot, the top of the limit is because they're serious about it. And if they don't have a budget, let's say half of the time, they're not serious. Next uh, goes right along with the last two is they don't have a time frame. You say, what's your deadline on this? What's your time frame? How soon, if you accept my estimate, if I give you an estimate and if you accept it, what's the time frame we're looking at to get this done? Somebody who's serious about getting it done, they have a time frame in mind. They're not looking for it to be, or maybe they are. Maybe they'll say it's July and maybe they'll say we just need it done before Christmas because they're very serious about getting the bathroom redone before their kids come in from Seattle for Christmas or something. So that's a time frame. But if they don't have any time frame, if they say, I don't know, I just depends on what it costs, you know, and it might take me some time to come up with the money. I don't if they really want the work done, they know that they want it done now or they know they want it done before such and such event. They will have an idea of the time frame. Don't walk away just because they don't have a time frame, but add that to the pot of other red flags. And when that pot starts getting heavy, you start thinking about walking away. All right. We're almost to the end, and there's not too many red flags up here that y'all are posting, so I'm going to try to finish these off. We've got four more, and then I'm going to go to the comments. Uh, next red flag is uh, they're a realtor for somebody who's trying to purchase a house. Now, again, realtors can be very good clients. I've had realtors in the past before I was in property management years and years ago when I kind of did more of this on the side, um, I had realtors who paid me very well and kept me stocked with work and uh, pushed my services to their clients, like like stood up for me and said, nah, this guy's good. His pricing's good. His work's good. You need to hire this guy. I've had good realtors. But what I found in the last three years running this business, almost solely property management, is I had a lot of realtors reach out to me. Now, if it's a realtor for the person who's selling the home, typically what's happening, if they're selling the home, they want you to do the work so that they don't have to sell the home for less because the buyers are trying to get a discount on the home based on cosmetic issues and torn window screens and stuff. And the buyers are trying to find a high price to say, hey, this will cost 500 to fix because this guy said it would, and I want you to take that much off of the, the selling price of the house. But the buyers aren't usually going to hire you to do the work. So my advice is not to tell them no. My advice is to just ask the, ask the, the realtor up front, are you just trying to get an invoice so that you can get a discount on a house? Or are you actually planning on hiring me? If they say, I'm actually planning on hiring you, I really do want to get this work done, then what I would do is I would give them a verbal ballpark on the spot. 
I would think in my head, you could, you'll get to where you can add it up very quickly. You start knowing what you're going to charge for most things, what most materials cost, what mo how much time most things take. And go in your head, and if in your head it comes to 600 tell the guy 1200 Say, hey, this may be cheaper after I get the estimate all written up, but I can tell you it's going to be as much as 1200 And if they look excited that you gave them an expensive price and they say, yeah, 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 get it written up, that's a very good sign that they're not intending on hiring you to do the work. Now, if they bulk at 1200 because realtors have a general idea what basic repairs cost, if they bulk at 1200 then they're probably actually planning on hiring you and they're bulking because they know it should be cheaper. That's one way you can figure that out. And if they're just honest and they say, honestly, we're j we just need an estimate so that we can get the house discounted, then charge them $150 for the estimate, you know, uh, just do it that way. Next, next red flag is, oh, I already said this one. They won't sign a contract. I wrote that down twice. Uh, next one is they ask you to pay cash under the table. Guys, if you want to be treated with respect as if you're a business, as if you're a company providing a service, companies don't take cash under the table. Just a handyman, he takes cash under the table. You don't take cash under the table. And that's also a very good way. So number one, it tells you they don't have a lot of respect for you because they view you as the kind of guy who takes cash under the table. And number two, every time somebody offers that, they're looking for a discount. I remember my stepdad when I was a kid, he put an estimate, we built custom kitchens. Like we built all the cabinets like from scratch in the shop, designed, custom built, installed. And he gave somebody this estimate, which blows my mind because I remember the number. Back then, You, we do a whole kitchen for like $2,500. And somebody came in and he, you know, they sat down to talk about the estimate and they said, what if, and the guy pulled out all these hundred dollar bills and he's like, what if I put $2,100 worth of 100 bills on your desk right now? And my stepdad said, well, then you'd still owe me about $4,000 or $400. <laughs> and it was just the funniest thing because you could tell he had heard that before people go, ah, oh, what if I just put cash down? Well, the price doesn't change. You would still owe me the balance. And the final one is the nickeling and diming. This is where I know all of you have experienced this, but I'm having it on the list anyways. This is where you say, I can install that new interior door for $350. You show up to install it and they say, oh, real quick, I've already got some paint would you mind touching that up for me real quick? They've always got like three real quick, easy things. Now, this is a very easy thing to deal with. When they say, hey, do you mind doing this other thing real quick? All you need to say, and you should know, again, off the top of your head, ballpark, you should be able to say, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'll do that for extra 30 bucks. How's that sound? If they get angry, if they get upset, and you'll see it in their eyes right away, because if they're hoping that you're going to do it for free, if they're planning on nickeling and diming you and doing work for free, they'll be offended when you say, oh, yeah, that's no problem. Just call it 20 bucks. You can tell by their reaction which person they are. And if they're the type of person that's upset that you won't give them free labor on top of the labor that you've already estimated and gotten approved, they're not your kind of client. I would never, I would just finish my job and get paid. I might even do the damn thing for free, but I'm not answering the phone when they call anymore because there are too many other good paying clients out there who will respect you. So that's the list, guys. I would very much like, if you're watching this video after the fact as well, this is a live, but it'll be on there. If you're watching this a month later, please comment any other red flags you have uh, email me or whatever. Now's a good time on here though. So if y'all have red flags, I'm going to be looking for those. See where we're at on these comments here. N8 said, red flag, uh, do you fix interior doors? And more importantly, do you take checks? Are you saying those questions are red flags? Because I get asked to fix interior doors a lot. That's pretty standard. And I do... 
I get asked if I take checks, but again, I'm with property managers. I can see the check thing being a red flag. I would not take a check for a big job. Like if it was a, let's say somebody said, can you purchase and install a new above the range microwave for me? So I'm spending $350 on materials minimum out of my pocket and then the labor as well. If somebody said, can I pay you with a check? Typically, what I, I just tell people no anyways. I don't want checks because they'll say, hey, I'll give you a check if you want. And then you don't have to pay the credit card processing fee. To which I reply, credit card processing fees are just part of the cost of doing business. I don't mind a bit. And then if I have some other reason and some other reason, you know, like, oh, I don't have my card on me. Then I say, that's okay. And when I send you the invoice, it's electronic. You can just click on it and pay it. No matter what they do, if they do, if they insist that they only want to write you a check, I guess I would call that a red flag. I don't really see that much, but yeah, there are people who will try to scam you by writing a bad check. So that's not bad. I'm going to write that here. And I'm going to think it through and try to figure out because there are so many legitimate, especially older people tend to want to write me checks. And sometimes if I can tell that they're really just, they're scared of paying with a credit card, I'll let them write a check. But I mean, if it's like a 32 year old, who seems who looks like he probably makes 150 a year and lives in a nice neighborhood and he only wants to write a check. I think I would just say, look, take your time paying the invoice. Like if you can't put your credit card in right now, do it tomorrow. But no, I just I don't want to check. But that yeah, that would be I think that would probably be a red flag. It's just not a thing I see a lot. Uh, Noel said, you got to talk to people in this business and get to know people. You can get a good feeling about other people and their seriousness based on how they interact with you. Trust your gut. That's very true, guys. You do develop a sense. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, there was one that I don't know why. I really, I cannot pinpoint what it was they said or how they said it. But when I was first starting out, I had somebody call me and ask me, to come give them an estimate for a job that was easily going to go over a thousand dollars. And in Arizona, if you don't have now, they have contractors license for hand, not for handymen. It's not that name, but they have like a residential repair and remodel contractors license that covers like up to five thousand dollars. Really easy to get. But if you have no licensing at all in Arizona, you can't charge more than a thousand dollars. If you charge one thousand and one dollars, you've broken the law and you'll get a fine and all of this other stuff. And they do have stings. And somebody called me one day and they were asking me to bid on a job that number one would probably go over a thousand dollars, but it wasn't that. It was I was working for homeowners at the time. I hadn't dove into property management yet. And I've done this business in the past, and so I just I have a feeling for how these conversations go. People call me, they typically have the same kind of tone, the same kind of uh, questions. You know, they're like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I have a shed and like one of the doors is kind of hanging, you know, from the hinge, like the hinge came off, but it's also got some rod on it. And I'm wondering, they typically, do they just speak to you a certain way? And then you're immediately going to ask certain questions that you know to ask. And they're going to answer in a certain way. There's just a feel for the conversation. And this one person just called me and it was, it just didn't feel right. They weren't speaking to me in the way that I know all standard homeowners are going to speak to a handyman that they've never met that they just called. And that was a red flag for me. And I just dropped the whole job. I'm just like, I don't know who this is. I don't know what this is, but it doesn't feel legit. By the way, guys, I've also had somebody call just for a funny story. I did have somebody call once that I had this gut feeling that they were okay with my pricing way too quickly. So I had just gotten started with property managers and I was pretty much set that that was going to be the future of my business. I had just gotten started, but I still did some work for some homeowners because I didn't have enough property managers to keep me busy. And this one called and it was a, a it was like a job that didn't sound like a job I wanted. And I just said, basically, I was just like, OK, but it's going to be a hundred and twenty five dollar trip. fee. And right away, they thought that was fine. And it was for the smallest, dinkiest little job that I really didn't even want to do. And they just agreed so quickly to the price. 
And it just didn't make sense because most homeowners aren't just going to say okay to $125 for a very teeny tiny job. Long story short, about two minutes later, we were texting, not talking. We were texting. And about two minutes later, all of a sudden they're saying, uh, they're like, is, is it weird? Is it okay if I ask you to take your shoes off while you're here? And I guess what they didn't understand was that's normal for me. In fact, when every house I walk into, if the homeowner answers without shoes on, I ask them if they'd like me to remove my boots. Like I make sure I wear matching socks that are clean and that my feet don't stink because that's one of the things I provide is my, a lot of people don't want to walk on their carpet or their floors with shoes on. It's just their thing. And they ask all their guests to remove their shoes. So if I see shoes off, I immediately ask. So when this person said, is it weird if I ask you to take your shoes off? I'm like, no, no big deal. Not at all. Like I, I do it all the time. And then they said, well, what if I ask you to take your socks off? And I'm like, I don't really understand why we'd want to do that. But, you know, and I had a feeling I'm like, oh, this is uh, like one of those weird kinky people, which, by the way, I don't there's nothing wrong with kink. I'm a let's say I'm a fan of kink, you know, but this was one that's not one of my kinks. So, uh, yeah, then they want to know if I could take my socks off. And I kind of got a feeling and I'm like, I don't really care. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll take my socks off, I suppose. It's not a big deal, but a little weird. And then they said, well, can you can you keep them off the whole time you're here? And then I'm like, OK, I think I'm going to have to charge extra for that. And I actually did tell them that I said, I'll charge extra for that. And they said, how much extra? And I said, how about five hundred dollars? <laughs> and they said, no, that's too much. And I said, OK, then moving on. Really hilarious. And I would have, man, I got no pride. You want me to take my socks off so you can look at my feet for 20 minutes while I swap your faucet out for $500? You bet your sweet ass I will. Where are we at? What's next? Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. We're down closer to the bottom, I think. Yeah, there we go. Silvernail said, I've visited 18 p.m. companies so far this week. No bites yet. Uh, Silvernail, uh, bulletproofhandymanbusiness at gmail.com. Do me a favor and email me what you're doing. Like, what package are you showing up with? What paperwork do you have printed out? How are you presenting it to them? How are you dressed? What vehicle are you? All the details you can give me. Let me know. Just do it in a private email, not here. Let me know everything that you're doing. Let me know what the property manager's experience is from the moment you arrive. And I should be able to help you because I've literally never heard of anybody going to 18 and not getting anything. So there may be something missing there or there may be some sort of like maybe you're raising a red flag that you don't know you're raising that I'll know you're raising because I just have the experience with the property managers. Let's see. Boy, I'm so tired. So 18 companies. Yeah, please do email me and give me some details. Bulletproofhandymanbusiness at gmail.com. I can probably help you out with whatever it is that's missing there. Mark Albert said, so much good advice, which all resonates with my experiences. Appreciate you for directing me into a successful path. You're very welcome, sir. I really appreciate you. You've been a great person to have on this channel. Noel said, I'll take I'll take their cash, but it won't be under the table. I always send a paid receipt. Exactly. And that's the same thing. I even tell, like I just swapped a faucet out for a family member of mine recently. And my deal with him is he knows, I tell all of my family, like I don't have a lot of time to help y'all with stuff because I'm running this business. But if you do want help, I will find some time and I will help you. And I'm not charging you, your family. And I'm just, I don't mix the two together. I did previously and now I don't for good reasons. And so now what I do is I say, look, no charge because you're family. When we're all said and done, if you feel like paying me something, I'm not going to stop you because I have a family to support. So I'm not ever going to say no. I'm going to put that money to good use but I'm not going to charge you and whatever you pay me, just so you know, I'm putting it in my books and I'm going to pay income taxes on it and sales taxes and every other damn business tax. 
and I'm going to send you a receipt so that you can use it to get a deduction off of your taxes this year. But everything's above board. Next, uh, Noel said, Colorado is an unrestricted state except major plumbing and major electrical. Ooh, that sounds, that makes a lot of sense because I've met a couple handymen from Colorado who were just kicking ass like two to three hundred dollars an hour sometimes in denver and big 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 jobs uh that makes sense now i did not know colorado that surprises me because there are a lot of overly regulated things in colorado that's really cool oh handyman mark said colorado has a twenty five hundred dollar limit hold on guys my son is calling and he's working hey what's up You should be able to, yes. Uh, you need to make sure to tell them that we spend like fifty to eighty thousand dollars a year. Like, if you have to, just go in and be like, "Hey, I'm a handyman. I buy paint here all the time. I know you guys don't usually allow returns, but this one really doesn't match, and I really need to be able to return this." And they're usually pretty nice about it. All right. Okay. All right, cool. I'm in the middle of doing a live stream, so I'm going to let you go, but call me if you need anything right. else. Yeah, bye. That was my son. He wanted to know, you typically can't return a paint match to Home Depot, uh, but the few times that I've needed to where they really just messed it up, I've been able to go in and just say, hey, I know y'all don't do returns on paint matches, but I'm a handyman. I'm here like every single day can you make an exception and they nearly always do yeah so handyman mark said colorado has a 2500 hundred dollar limit i don't know which is the case but even that that's a nice high limit like very few let's say move outs even even move outs that have had a lot of damage done they can go way over 2000 uh but 2500 is a pretty nice limit even if that is it Oh, y'all are y'all are talking about it. Uh, Mark, is that new requirement? I'm in Colorado Springs and regional hasn't mentioned anything. Last permit I pulled. Uh, let's see. Some other guys said, LOL. Handyman Mark said, uh, Ryan Hopkins, I'm also in the Springs. It's an El Paso County thing. Okay. So these guys are getting figured it out. <clears throat> Mark Albert said, I serve many Asian clients and always take my shoes off. Skechers, men's slippers, uh, loafers is all I wear. Yeah. And uh, I've also noticed that with African tenants like that are that have immigrated where you can tell from the accents and everything that they're recent immigrants from Africa. Almost all of them always have their shoes off and their floors are mopped spotless and, and, and they smell so good. The food Every time I go to a property where there are recent immigrants from the continent of Africa, where I can hear those accents, boy, the f they've always got the food going, and it smells like nothing I've ever smelled in this world. But they do tend to also have the shoes off. Let's see. Uh, la, 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 la. All right, Noel's got to go install the TV, and he's going to talk later. And I've been on here for an hour and 13. I got y'all all of my red flags. Now is the time at the end where I say, okay, guys, you've got a few extra minutes. I'm going to go ahead and log off. If I don't get any more questions or anything that we need to delve into, uh, I'm going to start doing a lot of videos soon, um, jobber videos like short ones i was about to do a bigger video because as y'all know they're my sponsor and i try to take care of my clients so to me that's nothing different than being a client they've taken care of me provided me with a source of income that allows me to make these videos for y'all take the time off work for that so i try to make sure that i do stuff but i want to do these videos with jobber there's so many features that I want to like point out. And I did a big video a while back pointing out a lot of them, but it's like an hour, 40 minutes and it's a long video. So there's more features that now I want to hit on because I've started using them or I'm diving into using them right now. And I think I'm going to do a lot of short videos. So a lot of like four minute long videos of here's this job or feature. Here's this job or feature. They all revolve around how they save you time. Because if you watch this channel, you know 
my biggest thing is time is money, man. I am always busy. I don't waste time. Anything that can save me time, I'm a fan of. So that's also in the works for today. I don't know if I'm going to get eight of them done or if I'm going to get one of them done and then get distracted with cleaning out the van or something. But that's what's next on the list. If y'all are looking out for me today. Uh, so yeah, there's still 30 people in here. I would think some of y'all may have some questions, but I'm not seeing anything. So again, I'm going to give y'all one or two more minutes. Pop in your last questions that you're ready for that you need before you go. Um, also guys, any requests on videos that you would like to see for content, especially if you're in the process of starting up or diving from homeowners into property management, I'm trying to wrap up the last information that I haven't put out over the last year, year and a half. And once I get that information wrapped up and I feel like you've got a complete package by watching all 130 videos, then I'm going to move on to the master class, which is literally within a month now. I've already told you I'm going to do it from right here. I've been putting hours per day into sort of planning it out, sectioning it out. I want it to be a step by step where literally if you know nothing other than you're familiar with tools and you'd like to be a handyman, this will walk you through it. And it's coming very soon. RDX Handyman said, time is money. What kind of van do you recommend for starting an efficient handyman business? Man, I'll tell you, my I love my van. I have a Chevy uh, Express 3500 Extended. So this is the Chevy Express line of vans, which are just the big, giant cargo vans. It's a 3500, which means it's a one ton, so it can carry a, it is a powerful engine. You load that puppy up no matter how much with a trailer behind it if you want. And when you hit that gas, that thing goes. But it's the extended. So it's got a longer wheelbase, which means it's got a longer cargo area. It doesn't feel too big for me to drive. It's not super tall. I don't like being way up in the air when I'm driving. But as far as the length and the width, it doesn't feel too big to be uncomfortable to drive. Never had a problem parking it in any neighborhoods. The ladder rack on top stops me from pulling into garages. I think I'm going to remove that and find a way to store the ladder maybe up on the ceiling inside because when it's hot out, when it's 108, you don't want to park your van outside. You want to park it in the garage so that when you leave, the seat doesn't burn you. But in fact, that's a video I'm doing soon. Let me write that down. Maybe I'll do that video today. Vans versus trucks versus trailers. I'm very, I've, I've done them all. And I'm very dead set that you need the right tool for the job. And if your job is doing what I'm doing with property managers, with multiple smaller jobs all day, you're driving all over town, in and out of neighborhoods, plus some bigger jobs here and there. I am very, very convinced a van is the answer. And I do need to do a video on that. So I think a van is the answer. And I think, for example, a Chevy Express 3500 is a good one. I think I could learn to love the Ford. I'm just a Chevy guy. What's the Ford one? I don't remember. Uh, Transit. There you go. The Ford Transits look like something that I could turn into a really great handyman van, but I know how to work on Chevy engines. I'm so familiar with Chevy because that's what I grew up with. You know, it's like DeWalt. If your first cordless tool is a DeWalt and your second one's a DeWalt, and then you've got the battery, so you buy more tools, and then you're on the platform, and no... Most of these guys aren't super, like, a lot better or worse than any others. It's just the platform. So I'm kind of a Chevy platform guy. So I hope that answers the question there. Um, what's the best way to find the exterior dryer vent of a condo unit? So many vents. I'm going to tell you something interesting with condo unit dryer vents. Oddly enough, I just saw some of these again like two days ago when I was doing a move out at a condo. The dryer vent for the unit upstairs was like directly above and to the left of the front door to the unit on the second. So the third floor dryer vent came out right near the front door of the second floor. But basically the dryer vents are going to be in one of two locations. They're going to be on the roof. And it'll be obvious if they are. They won't usually be. That is not the good place to have them, but many of them are. They'll either be on the roof or they'll be somewhere around the exterior of the building. And the best way to find out is to take, uh, and you can buy these at Home Depot. 
uh, dryer sheets, you know, the, the scented dryer sheets. If you're trying to find a dryer vent, throw a handful of scented dryer sheets into the dryer and turn it on and then walk outside and smell for it. You'll know where it is. Because if you don't even put clothes in, if you put just straight dryer sheets, like five to ten of them in there, you're going to smell it and you're going to smell it quickly. You'll find it real fast. Next, uh, our, and also, by the way, once you've narrowed down the area, you can just go to, like, say there's five vents in one area and you know it's this area. Just go and feel which one's blowing out hot air. RDX Handyman said, and it is profitable... And is it profitable to use just a truck bed? Man, I've done plenty out of just my truck. It's very doable. The downside of the truck is when you have a truck with a... I'm not going to go too deep in because I need to do a whole video. But basically with a truck, you're either going to have to put a cab over the truck, which means you got to crawl over all your stuff to get to the back end of the bed to get your stuff. Or if you don't do a cab, you're going to have to have some kind of like tono cover that comes up. It gives you access. But for me, the thing with the truck is it doesn't stop the rain from raining on your stuff. So whatever you put on there to stop the rain, since it's not a van that you can kind of walk in, whatever you put on top of there, you've now got to deal with getting under that to get to your stuff. For me, that's the biggest part. Uh, RDX said, uh, thanks, I'm on Auto Trader right now. Yeah, that's a good place to look for some stuff. And by the way, I've heard rumors that California passed a new law about commercial vehicles and their engines, their gasoline engines. And I don't know what the whole thing is, but long story short, a couple different guys I've met with some really nice vans said they just picked them up from California because you can pick them up cheap there because they just passed a law that's causing a lot of businesses to have no choice but to sell half of their fleet because it's not the right kind of engine for the year model or whatever. So there may be a lot of very affordable uh, work vans coming out of California. I don't know if it's true. You guys email me and let me know or comment or whatever. Let me know if that's true. And AK Dylan said, thank you, brother. You're a fine man and a gentleman. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate that. All right, guys, I feel like I've given you all quite a bit. We're at an hour, 21 minutes. The questions have slowed down and trickled to a stop. I'm going to get off of here. I might do another one later tonight. You never know, but I'm going to be trying to do a bunch of these videos to show you all where Jobber saves you time specifically, because that's the one thing I never have enough of. And if you do well, it's going to be the one thing you never have enough of. And I think that justifies the expense. Um, and like I said, they're my sponsor and they've been great to me and they've enabled me to give you guys all this content. I used to only have time to do like one video a month or maybe two. Oh, Alex said, greetings from Germany. I follow all your content. It's a different gameplay over here, but I still get a lot of great advice from you. The demand for handymen is just through the roof. Yep, awesome. Cool. I love Germany, by the way. I've been to Ramstein, Brandenburg, um, Frankfurt. I love Germany. It's a cool place. And y'all are some fine craftsmen over there. Much finer, on average, much finer over there than what you find over here. So love you guys. I hope you all are out there killing it, and I will see you soon. Oh, end.